Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I'm reading The Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doc Smith, and in collaboration with Lee Hawkins Garby. This is Chapter 12, The Mastery of Mind Over Matter. They descended rapidly, directly over a large and imposing city in the middle of a vast, level, beautifully planted plain. While they were watching it, the city vanished, and the plain was transformed into a heavily timbered mountain summit, the valleys falling away upon all sides as if far as the eye could reach. Well, I say, that's some mirage, exclaimed Seton, rubbing his eyes in astonishment. I've seen mirages before, but never anything like that. wonder what this air's made of, but we'll land anyway if we finally have to swim. The ship landed gently upon the summit, the occupants half expecting to see the ground disappear before their eyes. Nothing happened, however, and they disembarked, finding walking somewhat difficult because of the great mass of the planet. Looking around, they could see no sign of life, but they felt a presence near them, a vast, invisible something. Suddenly out of the air in front of Seton, a man materialized, a man identical with him in every feature and detail, even to the smudge of grease under one eye. The small wrinkles in his heavy blue serge suit and the emblem of the American Chemical Society upon his watch fob. Hello, folks, the stranger began in Seton's characteristic careless speech. I see you're surprised in my knowing your language. You're an inferior race of animals. Don't even understand telepathy. Don't understand the luminiferous ether or the relationship between time and space. Your greatest things, such as the skylark and your object compass, are merely toys. Changing instantly from Seton's form to that of Dorothy, likewise a perfect imitation, the stranger continued without a break. Atoms and electrons and things spinning and whirling in their dizzy little orbits, it broke off abruptly continuing in the form of Duchesne. Couldn't make myself clear in Miss Vanman, not a scientific convolution in her foolish little brain. You are a freer type, Duchesne, unhampered by foolish, soft fancies. But you are very clumsy, although working fairly well with your poor tools. Brookings and his organization, the Perkins Cafe, and his clumsy wireless telephones, all of you are extremely low in scale. Such animals have not been known in our universe for 10 million years, which is as far back as I can remember. You have millions of years to go before you will amount to anything, before you will even rise above death and its attendant necessity, sex. The strange being then assumed form after form with bewildering rapidity, while the spectators stared in dumb astonishment. In rapid succession, it took on the likeness of each member of the party, of the vessel itself, of the watch in Seton's pockets, reappearing as Seton. Well, Bunch, it said in a matter-of-fact voice, there's no mental exercise in you, and you're such a low form of the life that you're of no use to this planet, so I'll dematerialize you. A peculiar light came into his eyes as he stared intently to, into Seton's, and he felt his senses reel under the impact of an awful mental force, but he fought back with all his power and remained standing. What's this? The stranger demanded in surprise. This is the first time in history that mere matter, which is only a manifestation of mind, has ever refused to obey mine. There's a screw loose somewhere. I must reason this out, it continued analytically, changing instant Tenuously into Crane's likeness. Oh, I am not a re perfect reproduction. This is the first matter I have ever counted that I could not reproduce perfectly. There is some subtle difference. The external form is the same. The organic structure likewise. The molecules of substance are arranged as they should be, as are also the atoms in the molecule. The electrons in the atom. Ah, there is the difficulty. The arrangement and number of electrons as well as positive charges are entirely different from what I had supposed. I must derive the formula. Let's go, folks, said Seaton hastily, drawing Dorothy back toward the skylight. This gene materialization stunt may be play for him, but I don't want any of it in my family. No, you really must stay, Remus demonstrated the stranger. Much as it is against my principles to employ brute force, you must stay and be properly dematerialized, alive or dead. Science demands it. 
As he spoke, he started to draw his automatic pistol. Being in Crane's form, he drew slowly, as Crane did, and seen with the dexterity of a much sleight of hand work and years of familiarity with his weapon, drew and fired in one incredible rapid movement before the other had withdrawn the pistol from his pocket. The X dash plosive shell completely volatized the stranger and hurled the party backward toward the skylark into which they fled hastily as crane the last one to enter the vessel f- fixed his pistol and closed the massive door seaton leaped to the levers and as he did so he saw a creature mi- materialize in the air of the vessel and fall on the floor with a crash as he threw on the power It was a frightful thing, like nothing ever before seen upon any world, with great teeth, long sharp claws, and an automatic pistol clutched firmly in a human hand. Forced flat by the terrific acceleration of the vessel, it was unable to lift either itself or the weapon, and lay helpless. We take one trick anyway, Blaze Seaton, as he threw on the power of the attractor and diffused its force into the a screen over the party so that the enemy could not materialize in the air above them and crush them by mere weight. As pure mental force, you're entirely out of my class, but when you come down to matter, which I can understand, I'll give you a run for your money until my angles catch fire. This is childish defiance. It speaks well for your courage, but ill for your intelligence, the animal said, and vanished. A moment later, Seaton's hair almost stood on end as he saw an automatic pistol appear upo- upon the board directly in front of him, clamped to it by bands of steel. Paralyzed by this unlooked-for demonstration of the mastery of mind over matter, unable to move a muscle, he lay helpless, staring at the engine of death in front of him. Although the whole proceeding occupied only a fraction of a second, it seemed to Seaton as though he watched the weapon for hours as the sleeve drew back, cocking the pistol and throwing a cartridge in the chamber. The trigger moved and the hammer descended to speed on its way the bullet which was to blot out his life. There was a sharp click as the hammer fell. Seaton was surprised to find himself still alive until a voice spoke, apparently from the muzzle of the pistol with the harsh sound of a metallic diaphragm. I was almost certain that it wouldn't explode, the stranger said chatly. You are. I haven't devised that formula yet, so I couldn't make a real explosive. I could, of course, materialize beside you under your protective screen and crush you in a vice. I could materialize as a man of metal, able to stand up under this acceleration and do you to death. I could even, by a sufficient expenditure of mental energy, materialize a planet around your ship and crush it. However, these crude methods are distasteful and extreme especially since you have already given me some slight and unexpected mental exercise. In return, I shall give you one chance for your lives. I cannot dematerialize either you or your vessel until I work out the formula for your peculiar atomic structure. If I can drive the formula before you reach the boundaries of my home space, beyond which I cannot go, I shall let you go free. Driving the formula will be a neat little problem. It should be fairly easy as it involves only simple integration in 97 dimensions. Silence ensued, and Seaton advanced his lever to the limit of his ability to remain consciousness. Almost overcome by the horror of their position, in an agony of suspense, expecting every instant to be hurled into nothingness, he battled on with no thought of yielding, even in the face of these overwhelming odds. You can't do it, old top, he thought savagely, concentrating all the power of his highly trained mind against the intellectual monster. You can't dematerialize this, and you can't integrate above 95 dimensions to save your neck. You can't do it. You're slipping. You're all balled up right now. For more than an hour, the silent battle raged, during which time the skylight flew millions upon millions of miles toward Earth. Finally, the stranger spoke again. You three win, it said abruptly. In answer to the unspoken surprise of all three men, it went on, Yes, all three of you got the same idea, and Crane even forced his body to retain consciousness to fight me. Your efforts were very feeble, of course, but were enough to interrupt my calculations at a delicate stage every time. You are a low form of life, undoubtedly, but with more mentality than I supposed at first. I could get that formula, of course, in spite of you, if I had time. We were rapidly approaching the limits of my territory, outside of which even I could not think my way back. That is one thing in which your mechanical devices are superior to anything my own race developed before we became pure intellectuals. They point the way back to your earth, which is far away that even my men- mentality cannot grasp the meaning of the distance. I can understand the earth, can visualize it from your minds. 
but I cannot project myself any nearer to it than we are at present. Before I leave you, I will say that you have conferred a real favor upon me. You have given me something to think about for thousands of cycles to come. Goodbye. Assured that their visitor had really gone, Seaton reduced the power to that of gravity, and Dorothy soon sat up, Margaret reviving more slowly. Dick, said Dorothy ceremonially, did that happen, or have I been unconscious and just had a nightmare? <clears throat> it happened all right, returned her lover, wiping his brow in relief. See that pistol clamped upon the top of the board? That's a token in remembrance of him. Dorothy, though she had only been half conscious, had heard the words of the stranger. As she looked at the faces of the men, white and drawn with mental st struggle, she realized they had gone through, and she drew Seaton down into one of the seats, stroking his hair tenderly. Margaret went to her room immediately, and as she did not return, Dorothy followed. She came back presently with a look of concern upon her face. This life is a little hard on Peggy. I didn't realize how much harder for it would be than it is for me until I went in there and found her crying. It is much harder for her, of course, since I am with you, Dick, and with you, Martin, whom I know so well. She must feel terribly alone. Why should she? demanded Satan. You think she's some game... We think she's some game little guy. Why, she's one of the bunch. She must know that. Well, it isn't the same, insisted Dorothy. You'd be extra nice to her, Dick, but don't you dare let her know I told you about the tears or she'd eat me alive. Crane said nothing. A not unusual occurrence, but his face grew thoughtful, and his manner when Margaret appeared at mealtime was more solicitous than usual and more than brotherly in its tenderness. I shall be an interstellar diplomat, Dorothy whispered to Seaton as soon as they were done. Wasn't that a beautiful bee I put upon Martin? Seaton stared at her a moment, then took her gently before he took her into his arms. The information, however, did not prevent him from calling to Crane a few minutes later, even though he was still deep in conversation with Margaret. Dorothy gave him an exasperated glance and walked away. I sure pulled a boner that time, Seaton muttered as he plucked at his hair. It nearly did us. Let's test this stuff and not out and see if it's an X. Bart, while Duchesne's out of the way, if it is X, it's some find. So Seaton cut off a bit of metal with his knife, hammered it into a small piece of copper, and threw the copper into the power chamber out of contact with the plating. As the metal received the current, the vessel started slightly. It is X. Bart, we've got enough of the stuff to display to supply three worlds. Better put it away somewhere, suggested Crane, and after the mail had been removed to Seaton's cabin, the two men again sought a landing place. Almost in their line of sight, they saw a close cluster of stars, each emitting a greenish light in the spectroscope, revealing a blaze of copper lines. That's our meat, Martin. We ought to be able to grab some copper in that system where there's so much of it that it colors their sunlight. The copper is undoubtedly there, but it might be too dangerous to get too, so close to so many suns. We may have trouble getting away. Well, our copper is getting horribly low. We've got to find some pretty quick somewhere or else walk back home, and that's our best chance. We'll feel our way along. If it gets too strong, we'll beat it. When, when they had approached so close that the suns were great stars while they spaced in the heavens, Crane relinquished the controls to Seton. If you take the lever a while, Dick. Margaret and I will go downstairs and see if we can locate a planet. After a glance through the telescope, Crane knew that they were still too far from the group of suns to place any planet with certainty and began taking notes. His mind was not upon his work, however, but was completely filled with thoughts of the girl at his side. The intervals between his comments became longer and longer until they were standing in silence, both staring with unseeing eyes out into the trackless void but it was in no sense their usual companionable silence. Crane was fighting back the words he longed to say. This lovely girl was not here of her own accord. She had been torn forcibly from her home and then from her friends, and he would not, could not, make her already difficult position even more unpleasant by forcing his attentions upon her. Margaret sensed something unusual and significant in his attitude and held herself tense, her heart beating wildly. At that moment, an asteroid came within range of Skylark's watchful repeller, and at the lurch of the vessel, as it swung around the obstruction, Margaret would have fallen had not Crane instinctively caught her with one arm. 
Ordinarily, this bit of courtesy would have gone unnoticed by both, as it had happened many times before. But in that heavily charged atmosphere, it took on a new significance. Both blushed hotly, and as their eyes met each other, each saw what that which held them spellbound. Slowly, almost as if without volition, Crane put his other arm around her. A wave of deeper crimson swept over her face, and she bent her handsome head as her slender body yielded to his arms with no effort to free itself. Finally, Crane spoke, his usually even voice faltering. Margaret, I hope you will not think this unfair of me, but we have been through so much together that I feel as though we have known each other forever. Until we went through this last experience, I had intended to wait, but why should we wait? Life is not lived in years alone, and you know how much I love you, my dearest. He finished passionately. Her arms crept up around his neck. Her bowed head lifted, and her eyes looked deep into his as she whispered or answered, I think I do, oh, Martin. Presently, they made their way back to the engine room, keeping the singing joy in their hearts inaudible, and the kisses fresh upon their lips invisible. They might have kept their secret for a time, had not Satan promptly asked, Well, what did you find, Mart? A panicky look appeared upon Crane's self-possessed countenance, and Margaret's face fairly glowed like a peony. Yes, what did you find? demanded Dorothy. She noticed the confusion. My future wife, Crane answered steadily. The two girls rushed each into each other's arms, and the two men slightly gripped hands in a clasp of steel, for each of the four knew that these two unions were not passing fancies, lightly entered into, and as lightly cast aside, but were true partnerships, which would endure throughout the entire span of life. A plan... A planet was located, and the Skylark flew toward it, discovering that it was apparently situated in the center of the cluster of suns. They hesitated, but finding that there were no dangerous force present, they kept on as they drew nearer so that the planet appeared as a very small moon. They saw that the Skylark was in a blaze of green light, and looking out of the windows, Crane counted seventeen great suns scattered in all directions in the sky. Slowing down abruptly as the planet was approached, Seaton dropped the vessel slowly through the atmosphere while Crane and Duchesne tested and analyzed it. Pressure, 30 pounds per square inch. Surface gravity as compared to that of Earth, two-fifths. Air pressure about double that of Earth, while a five-pound weight weighs only two pounds. A peculiar combination, reported Crane, and Duchesne added. Analysis about the same as our air, except for two and three tenths percent of a gas that isn't poisonous and which has a peculiar fragrant order. Odor. I can't analyze it. I think it probably an element unknown upon Earth, or at least very rare. It would have to be rare if you don't know what it is. Acknowledged Seaton, look, locking the skylark in place and, look, and going over to smell the strange gas. Deciding that the air was satisfactory, the pressure inside the vessel was slowly raised to the value of that outside, and two doors were opened to allow the new atmosphere free circulation. Seaton shut off the power, actuating the repeller, and let the vessel settle slowly toward the ocean, which was directly beneath them, an ocean of deep, intense, wondrously beautiful blue, which the scientists studied with interest. Arrived at the surface, Seaton moistened a rod in the old wave and tasted it cautiously, then uttered a yell of joy, a yell broken off abruptly as he heard the sound of his own voice. Both girls started at the vibration set up in the dense air, smote upon their eardrums. Seaton moderated his voice and continued. I forgot about the air pressure, but hurrah for this ocean is am ammoniacal call copper sulfate solution. We can get all the copper we want right here, but it would take weeks to evaporate the water and recover the metal, but we can probably get it easier to shore. Let's go. They started off just above the surface of the ocean toward the nearest continent, which they had observed from the air. And that is the end of chapter 12.